proposed revisions that always seem to involve less respect for the rights of free nations and less freedom for the individual. These matters would be difficult under any circumstances. They are further complicated by a trend in Western countries away from global engagement and democratic confidence. Parts of Europe have developed an identity crisis. We have seen insolvency, economic stagnation, youth unemployment, anger about immigration, resurgent ethno-nationalism and deep questions about the meaning and durability of the European Union. America is not immune from these trends. In recent decades, public confidence in our institutions has declined. Our governing class has often been paralyzed. The American dream of upward mobility seems out of reach for some who feel left behind in a changing economy. Bigotry seems emboldened. Politics seems more vulnerable to conspiracy theories and outright fabrication. You both were members of Spell and Bones, a secret society at Yale. What does that tell us? Uh, not much, because it's a secret. <laughs> Is there a secret handshake? Is there a secret code? I wish there were something secret I could manifest. 322, a secret number? Uh, there are all kinds of secrets. Now, as you may know, my running mate, Tim, is Catholic and went to Jesuit schools. And one of the things he and I have talked about is this idea from the Jesuits of the Magis, the more, the better. Hello and welcome everybody to another reading Code Word Barbalon with your Klisman of Belgium and myself, Brett Norman, in the United States. And we're gathered here on Skype. Today is Sunday. May 13, 2018, and we are on page 438, and the chapter is called Sacred Symbols and Sac uh, Secret Rights, excuse me. Hello, Yerk. Hello, Brett. Uh, glad to hear from you again this evening on my time and uh, about uh, just past lunchtime at your place. Yeah, 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 thanks. Yep. The second attempt today to start reading chapter 44 mm -hmm. in the book uh, Code World Babylon, mm -hmm. uh, because we already came together this afternoon, but after reading a few sentences, I was taken away by the spirit into the wilderness. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yes. Uh, and the video started out to make uh, interesting comments and an interesting session that you can watch uh, in the link that probably Brett will provide you with. In yeah, this we're going to put that one up right away, I think. Here, uh, so. yeah, yeah, absolutely. You wouldn't mind you reading can... this paragraph again. We'll just start no, right no, in. No, of course not. Of course not. Start but from I the just... top, yeah. I just mean I just mean because I'm mentioning this here right now. I mean, whoever knows when this video right. is published. Oh, that yeah. New one that Good did this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Got <laughs> 70 to make. Published. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the problem. We have about 60 or 65 episodes um, between uh, right. the one that we are reading here right now to upload before yeah, this that's comes. Right. So, yeah, um, it might take my, a while. <laughs> yeah, my point is just because we're talking about this, just put the link in there, then people can see what else we did today. Right. That they have an right. idea, you know. But uh, yeah, of course, I'm going to start this right now. It's a shame that Michael is not there to join us, but maybe he will come in later. We'll see at some Yeah, we can always add him in if he comes up. So. We can always add him in when uh, when he comes on. Yeah, that's no problem. And um, I will, in the meantime, start reading Sacred Symbols and Secret Rites again, which starts with a quote that is right out of the King James Bible, because this afternoon I read it from the King James because I was a little bit insecure, because last time that P.D. Stewart uh, mentioned something of the Bible reading, he used the Amplified Bible, yeah. and I don't use anything else but the King James. But we checked and... Uh, this quote that comes from 2 Kings chapter 10, verses 26 through 28, is from the King James. It is also complete, right? There's nothing missing. Uh, yeah, thing? word for word, that? it was spot on as far as I okay. was paying attention. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I didn't <laughs> compare it. I, I, I just read the King James. I didn't have a look at this quote anymore. But Yeah, anyway, I was, let's I was proofreading from... it while you read it this morning, or <laughs> okay, your afternoon, right. actually. So, yeah, <laughs> worked out good. So, from Second Kings chapter 10, verses 26 through 28, we read, And they brought forth the images out of the house of Baal, and burned them. And they break down the image of Baal, and break down the house of Baal, and made it a draught house unto this day. Thus 
Jehu destroyed Baal out of Israel. Unquote. On March 8, 2007, the Religion News Service revealed that the Catholic Church in America reported its largest growth. The Roman Catholic Church grew to 69.1 million members in 2005, making it the fastest growing church in the country, followed closely by the Assemblies of God and the Mormons. According to the 2007 Yearbook of American and Canadian Churches produced by the National Council of Churches. This ends this little quote. The report went on to say, surprisingly, that the three mainline Protestant denominations, which are the Methodists, the Lutherans, and the Presbyterians, all, quote, reported membership declines in 2005, unquote. This is from Kevin Ekstrom, RNS, on the 8th of March 2007 in Washington, D.C. Catholicism, we can to come to the conclusion, is on the increase. Now, I will not waste another minute of commenting on what I just read, because we did a whole hour video on that earlier today. Yeah, that's right. And therefore, and therefore, Brett will put the description, uh, uh, the, the the link to that video in the description box of this one, and then you can listen to that one yep. hour and make up your own mind and the see title how will right be, or wrong we were. Right. The, the title will be The Falling Away, The Great Apostasy of This World. Look it up. Oh, yeah. That's a good idea. Okay. Yep. Yep. So, Yerk, you gave so, it that title when, when we were talking at the end of the conversation. <laughs> and I, I wrote it down. <laughs> okay, this is the title. I don't I don't give any titles. That's just the Holy Spirit speaking. Yeah, that's right. right. That's right. We Some, don't really, sometimes yeah. Sometimes I just can't stop him. He just babbles on. <laughs> no, no, it's it's important. No, but in a positive way. In a that's positive right. Way. Big so difference. now I'm going to do something that I didn't do the whole afternoon, starting the second paragraph on this page, which reads, But what if these millions celebrate a religion and rites, R-I-T-E-S, which they believed are honoring Christ and his teaching, but are, in fact, paying homage to another deity? And the leaders know it, but the followers don't. Yeah. That's the problem when you enter a Roman Catholic Church and you think you are venerating Jesus Christ and the Father God of the Bible. You're not. Because it's an idolatrous, superstitious, pagan religion that only dresses as Christianity. But when you take off the dress, you will find a naked woman that is the most ugly thing you have ever seen in this world. Pagan Rome, dressed up as Christianity. Inner teaching and outer teaching. Esoteric, inner, and exoteric, outer. Everybody who goes to a Roman Catholic church of the normal lay people, let me assure you, they think they are doing God's service going into that church. But they are actually helping and manifesting in the spirit of Antichrist. What if the profession, the author continues, of religion is merely a cloak to conceal a gross evil? What if this religion has a secret doctrine hidden beneath a liturgy of Christian titles and facades, but in fact are the rites of a more ancient religion, a universal Catholic creed? one found among the Hindus, Buddhists, Mexican Indians, Chaldeans, Egyptians, and the Arabs. There's a footnote here. I, yeah, I, I, I didn't even read this, and my comment, I think, was spot on, right? Right, yep. Okay, something interesting in that footnote, Brad. Well, it says, you will recall that earlier we read from Helena P. Blavatsky, who said in her secret doctrine that the secret was the worship of Parashiva. Yeah, we read that. That's mm -hmm. right. Okay, in 1975, the author continues, and sorry, in 1795. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> a Good little, catch. Little Good catch. <laughs> <A little different. laughs> nice. 
1795. Yeah, that's a huge difference. <laughs> <laughs> uh, about 200 years, yeah. 220, 100, yeah. 184 or something like that. Or something, whatever. Yeah. Uh, when, the, when Napoleon's soldiers took the Vatican, they overturned St. Peter's chair, and to their surprise, they found these words engraved upon it in Arabic letters. Quote, There's no deity but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. <laughs> mm -hmm. Could it be possible that the symbols, rituals, and the faith, fides, sola fide, yeah, you know that mm. from there, the faith of the Roman Catholic religion are not what they purport to be? Could the whole thing be a mockery? A mockery? Could the whole thing even be a sham? We do not here attack religion nor are we opposed to religion, but, as Godfrey Higgins commented, not every monument of antiquity marked with a cross or with any symbol or monogram of Christianity can be assumed to have been of Christian or origin. Now, I'm sorry, I cannot help to make comments here. <laughs> yeah. This little few sentences here are so full of error I cannot leave this uncommented. He says, could the whole thing be a mockery or a sham? We do not here attack religion. Well, I do attack <laughs> religion. <laughs> Me that too, is, Jörg. <laughs> I agree. Wow. That is a man-made belief system Yeah, that has That's nothing right. to do with the true faith that is imputed to us by the Father through Jesus Christ and makes men righteous again. The true faith, as I like to call it, has nothing to do with quote-unquote religion. This religion that venerates idols and prays to fallen angels and other kinds of demons and statues and images must be attacked by Christians, must be exposed by Christians. That's our job to do. Right. He continues, nor are we opposed to religion. Yes, I am, because he would say, oh, Jörg, but there's religious freedom. Don't you respect freedom of religion? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, let me ask you one thing. Do you think that there's freedom of religion in the kingdom of Jesus Christ? How much freedom of religion was there in the Israel of the, uh, in the times of the law and the prophets? How much religious freedom did God the Father and did Jesus Christ allow the Israelites to have? There's your answer. I don't even answer. I let the Bible speak for itself. Is there any freedom of religion in the kingdom of Christ? You answer that for yourself. I don't have to answer that. Read the Bible and you will have your answer. So, I am opposed to quote-unquote religion. Not every monument of antiquity marked with a cross or any symbol of Christianity can be assumed to have been of Christian religion. Well, the Christian faith, the true faith that I adhere to, does not have any symbol, therefore not any monument of antiquity marked with anything says anything to me as a Bible-believing Christian of the true faith of Jesus Christ. The cross is not and never was and never will be a symbol of Christianity. It was used in pagan times long before Christianity came ever up before Jesus Christ ever showed up in this world. That's they were right. crucifying people, hanging people on the tree because the Old Testament or the Law and the Prophet speaks about that, that people were hung to the tree. And we are not speaking about the gallows. We are speaking about nailed to a tree or nailed to a cross, on, on a wooden cross. And when you read, for example, Alexander Islop's The Two Babylons, you will learn that the cross actually is just the symbol of the first name of the Jesus of the Roman Catholic Church, Tammuz. It has nothing to do 
with real, true faith and Christianity in the biblical sense. Yeah? So, not every monument of antiquity marked with a cross or with any symbol of Christianity can be assumed to have been of Christian origin. No, when you understand what Christianity really is, nothing, any, not one monument of antiquity, not, not one monument or sign or whatever marked with a cross or whatever symbol, quote-unquote monogram, of quote-unquote Christianity is really of Christianity. Real Christianity adheres to all ten of the commandments, and the second is one of the most important ones. And what does the second say, the second commandment? Well, let me just pick up my Bible and open, and we can read in the second book of Moses, Exodus, and there in chapter 20, let me just see that I get there, just a second. Um, Exodus chapter 20, and there it reads, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing great mercy unto thousands. Great, I just added here. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. What does God say about where this guy, Godfrey Higgins, comments on not every monument of iniquity, antiquity marked with a cross or with any symbol of Christianity can be assumed to have been of Christian, Christian origin. Nothing on any monument of antiquity marked with anything or with any symbol can be assumed to have been of real, biblical, true faith, Jesus Christ following belief. This is how that sentence should read. Right, Brett? That's right. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> and every Bible-believing Christian should really, really take a good look at Exodus 20 over and over and over again. Because there is a lot to think about here. And don't rush it. And these little explanations that we do make the reading of this book much more worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people will easily read over these sentences and say, yeah, he's right. No, he's not right. <laughs> oh, the author. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, Godfrey, uh, Godfrey Higgins, the guy that he quotes here, he's not sure. right. Mm -hmm. yeah? Because there is not one monument of antiquity marked with a cross or any other symbol that can be assumed to have been of the real true faith. Yeah, that's right. I think a lot of these symbols are used out of ignorance and they're used out of tradition. And, <clears throat> you know, it's part of the process that we go through in our, in our faith that, you know, uh, certain things that we do, we don't even know we do are wrong. And if, we continue to do them, we just continue to make the same mistake. What did Jesus Christ say about traditions? The traditions of the scribes and the Pharisees? Ooh. That those traditions block the way to heaven, right? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. Through vain deceit. Through the traditions of men and not through Christ. Exactly. Rest my case. Mm -hmm. Like all secret societies, the author continues, the Catholic Church, too, has an inner and outer doctrine. Throughout history, it has used symbols and rituals as a means of disguising its true doctrines. 
Speaking of the secret inner doctrine of the early founders of the Roman Catholic Church, Albert, Pike's write, Albert Pike writes, quote, The mysteries were open to the fideles, meaning the initiated. A fideles comes from fide, faith, so means the faithful. And no spectators were allowed at the communion. Tertullian, a founding father of Catholicism, thank you, Albert Pike, for being correctly and not calling Tertullian a father of the church, but a founding father of Catholicism. That is correct. I applaud Pike for this. Says in his apology, none are admitted to the religious mysteries without an oath of secrecy. We appeal to our Thracian and Eleusian mysteries. Clement, Bishop of, Alex, uh, Bishop of Alexandria in Egypt, was born about A.D. 191, says in his Stromata that he cannot and would not explain the mysteries because he should thereby, according to the old proverb, put a sword into the hands of a child, unquote. And Cyril, Catholic Bishop of Jerusalem in AD 315 through 386, said, quote, The splendor is for those who are early enlightened. Obscurity and darkness are the portion of the unbelievers and ignorant. Just so the church discovers its mysteries to those who have advanced beyond the class of catechumens. We employ obscure terms with others. Catechumenus, which I just read, is an old uh, Latin term, I think, for catechism. Yeah, mm. That's right. The Catholic Church here admits to using obscure terms to hide that true meaning from the ignorant or catechumens. In other words, there is a secret doctrine. Uh, catechumens would then be the people who use the catechism because they are not allowed to use the Bible, you know. Mm -hmm. The Roman Catholic right. Church forbids the reading and understanding of the Bible, but it promotes the reading of their catechism. The problem is, and, is in Luther, in the Lutheran faith, they have the Lutheran catechism, and then that kind of mixes yeah, it up a little bit. Yeah, you know, the, the, the point is, and that is something that I learned in reading that Griesinger book about mm. the history of the Jesuits, uh, he says that the Roman Catholic catechism was actually just a response to the Lutheran catechism, oh, because... Geez. Because the people found it so easy in the few words that con that are contained in the Lutheran Catechism yeah. to identify themselves with quote unquote religion, and the Roman Catholic Church wanted to have something even in the same way easy accessible to mm -hmm. their religion, and right. they just copied the Catechism of the of the Lutherans and made it their own. Ah. Wow. So the Lutheran catechism is older than the Roman Catholic catechism. Oh, wow. Huh? I did not even know that. <laughs> That's in the Griesinger book, uh, dude. It's wow. so interesting to read that. That's I can't fantastic. Tell. Yeah. Well, a lot of piece, a lot of the pieces to the puzzle to put together here, Jörg, you know. Yeah. yeah That's absolutely. why I never advise anyone to rush through their research. Just take it take it on your own pace and and um, you know, um don't get all wired up about it unless the spirit leads you to, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> that can happen. So in other words, there is a quote-unquote secret doctrine. Oh, that's probably the reason why uh, Helena petrova Provatsky wrote a whole book about that, right? Mm -hmm. Chrysostom. Bishop of Constantinople in AD 354 through 417 confirms that there is such a secret doctrine, quote, I wish to speak openly, but I dare not. And I have to stop right here. <laughs> no, no, no. Do you know why? That brings me back to rulers of evil. Really? Yeah. There was a, uh, was it, was it Jefferson? Who yes. wrote to his wife Abigail okay. in a in a in a private letter about the founding of the United States in 1776, and he said, 
if I could uh, write openly, mm. free, he couldn't even to his wife. Wow. And this is just the same that we read here about the Bishop of Constantinople, Chrysostom. I wish to speak openly, but I dare not. And Jefferson wrote unto Abigail, his wife, if I could write or speak openly. Hmm. The same secrets hidden all the way, you know? Yep, this is how it works. Yep, this is one of the mechanisms right here. It's so interesting how you can make these connections when you see these same sentences pop up in this book and in that book again. And uh, this is a mm. uh, a different tide difference of almost fourteen hundred years. Yes, huge. between three fifty four and 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 uh, something when when he wrote this in seventeen seventy six, because the letter from Jefferson to Abigail was written in seventeen seventy six. Oh wow, this is much if, older. Yeah. If I could speak openly using almost the very same words, but dealing with the same subject. Mm hmm. Hmm. Yep, that's right. History repeating itself, in a sense. I wish, I wish to speak openly, but I dare not on account of those who are not initiated. I shall therefore avail myself to disguising terms, discoursing in a shadowy manner. Where the holy mysteries are celebrated, we drive away all uninitiated persons, and then close the doors. Unquote. And Cyril of Alexandria, who was made bishop in AD 412, and who transposed the pagan goddess Isis, into the Virgin Mary, says on in his seventh book against the writings of Julian, quote, These mysteries are so profound and so exalted that they can be comprehended by those only who are enlightened, unquote. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> so oh, in the in the founding in the very first years of the Roman Catholic Church we are speaking about enlightenment we are speaking about illuminati we <laughs> yeah. are speaking about luciferianism mm -hmm. right that's right isn't is it is it then any wonder that they sing about lucifer as they did in the easter chant a few years ago that i have and you have on your computer no Maybe you should put that video at the end of this that people can hear and listen and, and, and see that. Yes. Do you have that one with the titles? I know you sent it, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and... so look that up and put that at the end of this video. Okay. Very interesting, I think, in this regard. Mm -hmm. And interesting also, of course, is that Cyril, the Bishop of Alexandria, transposed the pagan goddess Isis into the Virgin Mary. So he is the one responsible for all the Mary veneration where Mary is made the queen of heaven that we read of already in Jeremiah chapter 44. Yeah? Mm. He is responsible for... Who is? Um, uh, Cyril. Cyril. Oh, all right. Cyril of Alexandria, who was made bishop in AD 412. Oh, okay. It was and who past. transposed okay, the God. pagan goddess Isis into the Virgin Mary. You know, the point was, uh, that is 412, so this is less than 100 years after Constantine made, uh, quote-unquote, Christianity the state religion of the pagan Roman Empire. And by that changed pagan into papal Rome. Not guarded with the Pope yet, that came a few hundred years later in 606, but... Uh, Christianity was hijacked at this moment. And you know, Brett, from other readings, of course, that the Romans had a lot, a lot, a lot of deities, a lot of gods oh, they yeah, prayed yeah, to. Yeah. And all these gods, major gods and minor gods that they had, and there's a list of them in the book uh, Babylon Mystery Religion from Ralph Woodrow, mm -hmm. when you get a copy of the real book, not his fake book that he wrote later on, but the original one that I did read on my channel. You can look that up. 
there's a list of these gods, and all these gods were just given Christian names. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, the most the most uh, famous example, you know too, that is when they took out, out of the Pantheon in Rome, the statue of Jupiter, put oh, it into nice. St. Peter's uh, Basilica, and named it St. Peter. Yeah. That's right. Huh? That's right. And the veneration of the Virgin Mary is just the ver veneration of the pagan goddess Isis. And Isis is nothing else but Semiramis, which is the wife of Nimrod, which is part of the Babylonian trinity. That's why the Roman Catholic Church proposes a trinity that is not biblical. Mm -hmm. That's you right. see how this is all intervolving? Mm -hmm. And this he did in 412. So this is um, this is the quote he said, but somewhere in that time, he venerated Isis into the Virgin Mary. By that, making it easier for pagans to come to Christianity, because they could worship the same goddess and just giving it another name. Mm -hmm. That's why the people today bow down to Mary, because they actually bow down to Semiramis. The people of today who do that of course, have no idea. No. They are betrayed because they are not initiated, because they don't study history. No. But whenever you bow down to Mary, which, first of all, of course, Exodus chapter 20, verse 4, remind you, uh, is wrong. But even if you do, you are not even venerating Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ. You are venerating Semiramis, the goddess of Babylon who gave birth to the sun god. After Nimrod died, was impregnated by the sun, gave birth to Tammuz, and married her own son. Yep, see, that's what you get when you don't pay attention to history or the Bible, or rather the, uh, the historic truth behind the Bible, maybe would yep. be more accurate to say. And then this guy, after doing this abominable work, says... These mysteries are so profound and so exalted that they can be comprehended by those only who are enlightened. That is to say, the real doctrines of the Catholic Church are revealed only to the initiates or illuminated, not the catechumens or uninitiated, the masses. You know, this is why the catechumens re just read the catechism. Because they don't read the real book. They don't read the Bible, right. which could tell them everything, right. whether it's right or wrong. Yep. That's just it. The great quote unquote Saint Augustine, who lived between 347 and 430, who was Bishop of Hippo and a central pillar to the Roman Catholic Church, confirmed this fact when he said, quote, Having dismissed the catechumens, we have retained you only to be our bearers, be our hearers, sorry. Uh, the light is not that <laughs> good mm. to see the difference between an H and a B here. So, having dismissed the catechumens, we have retained you only to be our hearers because of sublime mysteries which none are qualified to hear, but those who by the master's favor, are made partakers of them. To have taught them openly would have been to betray them. Unquote. So now I'm, I, I, I said a few times already the catechumens are the quote unquote lay people, the uninitiated, the masses mm -hmm. who just of the catechism. But I also told you the catechism is something the Roman Catholic Church just invented in the run of the late 16th century to counter the catechism of Martin Luther. So there was no catechism at that time, but the word was still used because these people were not allowed to read any word of the Bible. They were just allowed to listen. That's why he's speaking about hearing here, to listen to the sermons, if you want to call it that way, mm -hmm. the priests gave from the pulpits. Yes. They were not to check that to the Bible, to the true word of God, because the Bible was a forbidden book in the Roman Catholic oh. Church, because they knew from the beginning that everybody who reads the Bible will understand that the papacy is the Antichrist. Comment, and you have yeah. That, of course. Yeah, please. 
uh, when I was growing up in the Lutheran Church, you know, I don't ever recall anyone bringing a Bible to the pew and and checking what the pastor said, ever. I mean, we had Bibles and we read them, but they were NIV Bibles or they were RSV Bibles or something of the like, and. You know, you could almost choose any Bible you want and bring it and use it. And, it, you know, I don't think anyone would have any quarrel with it. And I don't know. It's just so strange when you really think about uh, what's going on with these churches. But uh, anyway, you're, I mean, it's a confusing mess when you get into uh, what the churches are doing with the Word of God. It's really confusing. Well, yeah, you know, the more you tell me about that, the more uh, the, the more glad that I am that I have never been part of any churches uh, in, in the sure, past. Sure, sure, yep, yep. I, I know that uh, when I was about the age of, oh, what was that, 12, 13 years or something, I had a classmate who uh, went uh, twice a year or so on a retreat with his congregation, kind mm -hmm. of a church. I don't know if they were Seventh-day Adventists or just Adventists or Baptists or pff, I don't sure. know. And um, he asked me if I wanted to come along. You know, they were camping. Uh, they were doing excursions then with uh, canoes. And I love to, oh, canoe, uh, yeah. or to kayak, you know, to no kayak. Not, not canoes, but to, to, to kayak. And I love to kayak because my father was in a uh, in a uh, in a club in a kayak club in Hamburg in the organization. Oh, not you would just love it where I live, York. We have yeah, rivers sure. all over the place up here. It's just fantastic for kayaking up here. Sure, I would absolutely love that. Yeah. So in that time, I, I went with him, and of course, these guys were, yeah religious mm. they they mm -hmm. believed in god they did morning prayer they did lunch prayer they did evening prayer and then in the evening when there was a uh, when there was a, a campfire lit they sat around it and they sang and they sang so songs of uh, oh, thanking yeah. god for this and for that and i i did all i i, I did along with them you know because mm -hmm. what, what did i care for the text i had a good time you know? right that's what matters <laughs> yeah yeah and yeah no that what matters to me and that time but sure. more than more than that i have never been engaged in church and of course yeah i i went to the uh, the obligated masses and 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 lessons uh, to get my quote unquote confirmation when i was 14 years old mm -hmm. but i only did that because i wanted to receive the presents from the family when they when we were having the feast i didn't <laughs> believe in god really <laughs> yeah and yeah. that's that's all my involvement in the church I have, you know. I, I wasn't even baptized before, so one well, it's day. It's interesting uh, you I, say that because you know you can go to these churches and and have the same experience. You, you know, you're not forced to believe anything. It's when, just a matter I, of participating. You know, will you when they, participate? When they, when they gave me the date to to baptize me, because you have to be baptized to get confirmation, of course. Mm -hmm. And my parents didn't baptize me when I was younger because my mother was Protestant. My father didn't believe anything. And um, they said that I should make up my own mind and get baptized when I think I'm ripe for it, mm -hmm. right. <laughs> which is a wonderful thing to do, which is biblically, of course. Yeah. 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 <laughs> But I got baptized, of course, for the complete wrong reasons, only because I wanted to get presents for the confirmation. But the point right. is when I got that date, that was on a Saturday. And on the same day, I had an appointment with a few friends of mine, and we were playing military games outside in, a, in, in the woods outside of Hamburg in the forest, uh, which is called the Bismarck Forest. You know, mm -hmm. Bismarck, who was the German chancellor of the Second Reich, and the founder of the Second Protestant Reich in 1871, um, there was a castle of his family right outside of Hamburg. That's where his family resided. Uh -huh. He, of course, was long dead already, but that's in Ahrensburg. That's, uh, uh, that's near Hamburg. Mm -hmm. And we had an appointment there to do our military games, you know, because I was quite a Nazi at that time. Sure. <laughs> I was so easy influenced by everything. I was everything and nothing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> But the yep. funny thing is, I had my I had my baptism before that, 
So after that, I had to jump into the train and go there because that was on the other side of Hamburg. That was all, all to the east of Hamburg, and I lived in the west. So I had to go for more than an hour by train for that. Ah. So I didn't have time to go to the baptism and then change my clothes. So I went into the church with military boots and my camouflage sure. <laughs> shirt sure. and, and trousers in there. <laughs> yeah. And I got sprinkled some water on my head and said, okay, can I go now? And I went out there and that was my baptism. <laughs> 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 uh, really, that's yeah. a true story. Wow. That's a true story. How old were you when this happened? Uh, about 14 years old. Oh, wow. Okay. 13 to 14 years. Ah, gotcha. Uh, I, was, I, was, I, I got confirmation in the year that I got 14, but uh, my birthday is uh, in the midst of June. And I, I guess that was a little bit earlier than that. So probably 13 on the verge to become 14 or 14 on the verge to become 15. I, I don't remember. Somewhere anymore. in there. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, somewhere in there. I, I don't remember the exact year. No, I wouldn't that. either. That's a long time ago. <laughs> that's a long time ago. <laughs> well, not that long, but long enough. Yeah. Right. Well, almost 40 years now, Brad. Yeah, 30 plus. Yeah. <clears throat> Anyway, let's continue, but I thought that was an interesting story to tell cool. for once here. Sounds good. Here we are told, the author continues, in plain language, that Roman Catholicism is, at its core, a religion of occult, which is another word for hidden, or secret doctrines. So, using the same word twice, eh? mm -hmm. occult means hidden, eh? Secret doctrines, very key word right there, meaning doctrine yeah. is of the Bible, but they twist the Bible so bad and they keep it a secret because they can't let you know the truth. Yeah, but because if you read the no Bible, secrets. you can uncode it and figure it out for yourself, right, Yerk? Yes, and you are right when you say the Bible is full of doctrine, but the Bible is less full of secrets. There's not one No, secret there's no secrets. The That's right. <laughs> Big difference. Yeah. 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 So again, here we have an example that the Roman Catholic Church is 180 degrees opposite to what to that what the Bible teaches. Yeah, that's it. Yeah? Yeah. The Bible has an open doctrine, and Roman Catholicism has secret doctrines. There we go. The sublime mysteries is a term used to express the custom which prevailed in the earliest ages of the Catholic Church, and to this day by which the knowledge of the more intimate mysteries of Gnosticism was carefully kept from all but those who were initiated into the occult mysteries of the Gnostic faith. Of the Gnostic faith. Of the man-made faith. Maybe that's a way how you can better understand it. Sure, yeah. It has nothing to do with the creator of this world. The As deceiver, the do. liar, the father of lies. That's what that's exactly. all about. Exactly. Exactly. Couldn't have said it better, Brad. Great. Quote, unquote, Saint Basil in De Spir Sanct. So this is probably De Spiritus Sanctus, means the Holy Spirit. Chapter 27 writes, quote, These things must not be told to the uninitiated. Unquote. All of the founding fathers <laughs> of <laughs> Catholicism oh. were Malachis or occultists before they were initiated into the Church Catholic. All of these early quote unquote fathers were bound by the code of the discipline of the secret, and it is their occult teaching that were, quote-unquote, Christianized as Roman Catholicism. Thus, it was that Manichaeism, uh, sorry, it thus it was that Manichaeism, occultism, or Gnosticism was woven into Roman Catholic, quote-unquote, Christianity. Very interesting word, Yerk, this Manichaeism, Manichae, Manichaeism. Or yeah. Manichaeism, or however that's pronounced? Yeah. I'll have to look that up while you're reading here. Yeah, okay. But I applaud the author for every little sentence that he wrote in this little paragraph. Mm -hmm. Just wonderfully how he didn't wind any 
uh, he did he didn't give any spin on it. So he was uh, actually exposing this quote unquote religion. Yeah, where he said in the beginning, um, we are not opposed to religion or attacking religion, but he is yeah. at least exposing what Roman Catholicism truly is. Yeah. That's right. The statements by the two Cyrils and those of St. quote-unquote St. Augustine reveal that the catechism of the Catholic Church is for the catechumens, as I always said from the beginning, and is a method of explaining the mysteries of the Catholic Church in a way that will obscure or hide that true meaning from the Catholic catechumens or uninitiated lay masses. The Roman Catholic Church revived its practice of the catechumenate, which its rite of Christian initiation for adults, RCIA, at the Second Vatican Council, which explicitly states at points 64 and Oh, what a coincidence, 66, of the Constitution of the Sacred Liturgy, Sacrosanctum Concilium, hmm. quote, the catechumenate for adults, comprising several distinct steps, is to be restored. By this means, the catechumenate may be sanctified by sacred rites, R-I-T-E-S. Rituals. Unquote. In 1980, Antichrist Pope John Paul II said of the mystical worship of the Catholic Mass, quote, The Church not only acts, but also expresses herself in the liturgy, lives by the liturgy, and draws from the liturgy the strength for her life. Unquote. Yeah, the Roman Catholic Church. Hmm. And the true Church of Jesus Christ not only acts, but also expresses herself in the Bible, lives by the Bible, and draws from the Bible the strength for her life. Quite a difference with Roman Catholicism, right? Oh, yes. And the 1995 Catholic Catechism says, quote, Sacramental celebration is woven from signs and symbols. The sacraments of the Church do not abolish, but purify and integrate all the richness of the signs and symbols of the cosmos and social life. Unquote. Here, Rome confirms the use of signs and symbols in her liturgy. So, what is the secret doctrine hidden from the catechumens of which Bishop Cyril, Chrysostom, and St. Augustine spoke? For that, we must wait until the very end. But I will here contrast this secretism with the words of Jesus. Quote, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, and in secret have I said nothing. As we can read in John chapter 18, verse 20. Again, I got a comment when... The, yeah, done. again, the Roman Catholic Church is 180 degrees opposite to the Bible and the true word of God. Please, Brett. Oh, yes, the past... Uh... Many sentences here are just loaded, aren't they? Loaded. Um, Absolutely, yeah. So we have a couple footnotes from the popes. Um, on the last page, uh, right beneath that sentence in 1980, um, this one is Pope Paul VI at Vatican II in December 4, 1963, from this quote, the catechumen for adults, compromising several distinct steps is to be restored. By this means, the catechumate may be sanctified by sacred rites, and those are rituals, yes. So I did look up that word, Yerk, uh, maniche, or... Uh, mm -hmm. Manichaeism. 
well, the word maniche right here is very interesting. Um, it says right here, uh, from Manus or Manichaeus, the founder of the sect who lived in Persia in the third century after Christ, an adherent of a religious system widely accepted from the third to the fifth century, composed of Gnostic Christian, Maz- uh, excuse me, Mazdine, and pagan elements, as representing Satan as co-eternal with God. Mm-hmm. Can I can I just leave a comment there, Brett? please? Very important. What just shoots into my mind. Um, what you just read is, of course, something that we should always do when we prepare before a reading. Mm -hmm. But neither you nor I have the time to read this book in advance before we bring it to the table and read it to the public. So in that case, it's just wonderful that when I do the reading, you have the possibility to look some words up that we should actually study on beforehand to make ourselves familiar with those terms and understand them. Right. But the point that I want to say is probably taking the, or or is now, let's say, uh, the cream to the pie that we are selling you here. Mm -hmm. What you just read, what you just read is the basis that the Roman Catholic Church used in the 6th and 7th century to get the Arabs to Mohammedanism, Mohammedanism, mm. what we call today the Muslim faith. Mm-hmm. They had a kind of twisted, quote unquote, Christianity that was mixed with Gnosticism. That's what you just read. That's Manichaeism, right? Mm-hmm. Right. That is nothing else what the Jews brought out of Babylon when they brought their Talmud out of Babylon with them. That's right. This is for the Arabs. And those betrayed Arabs then have been sold and even other quote-unquote Christianity, which is Roman Catholicism for Arabs, Mohammedanism, or the Quran, or Islam is just Roman Catholicism for Arabs. And they had an easy game playing it on those guys who were already betrayed by Manichaeanism. Wow. There you got it. Yes. And that, to me, is an absolute confirmation on everything that Alberto Rivera always stated and Mm -hmm. said. Mm -hmm. By the way, this is from the 1937 uh, Oxford Universal Dictionary. That mm-hmm. I have. It's a ten volume set. I'll take a photo of this and put it in the video. Interesting. Yeah. 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 yeah it just sure wonderful. is. Mm-hmm. It's great to have this set sitting right here, and I can look up any any word anytime it comes mm-hmm. to mind. But this just hit me because we're dealing with something. I mean, this is some heavy stuff. I mean, we. It's good we're not rushing through this. Actually, I think. Um... Just an idea for the future, Brett. Uh, you and I should take some time and study that Manichaeanism a little bit better. Sure. And then do a video solely on that subject. And what I just commented here, the relation between Manichaeism and the then later founded faith of Islam put mm-hmm. on the Arabs by the Roman Catholic Church. I think that would be a very interesting subject for us to do. Cool. Yeah, that sounds good. There's a lot of different avenues for research on that. And uh, yeah, we'll have to look into that. That's a really great idea, actually. So we're going to do that. And that video is probably coming out long before this one. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, But no problem. No problem. But, you know, this is what this book leads us to to Mm -hmm. further study and to further revelation and to get further wisdom imputed by the Holy Spirit on these subjects. We have almost reached now, Brett. I just want to continue this last little paragraph before we come to the next uh, sub-chapter. 
Oh wow! Which is called yeah. Pops Pallium, which we'll be will be reading next time. But I just want to continue this little paragraph here, where it says, because we just ended with a quote from Jesus Christ, "I spake openly to the world." I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, and in secret have I said nothing. Nope, zilch. And Paul says in Ephesians 5, uh, verse 11, quote, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Um, what did P.D. Stewart say a page before? Uh, nor are we opposed to religion. We do not attack religion. And what does the Bible say here? Expose religion. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Man-made belief systems. Mm -hmm. Christ spoke expressly against mysticism and secret doctrines. Quote, No man, when he hath lightened a candle, put it in the secret place, neither under a bushel, but on a candlestick and they which come in may see the light, as we can read in Luke chapter 11, verse 33. The Law and the Prophets, book of Isaiah, states, quote, I have not spoken in secret from the beginning, in Isaiah 48, 16. The Bible uses symbols and signs to explain its message, not to conceal. Said Jesus, quote, there is nothing hidden which shall not be made manifest, neither anything kept secret which shall not be spread abroad. Unquote. As we can read as well as in Mark 4.2, also in Luke 8.17. But the Catholic Church uses seemingly quote-unquote Christian icons to conceal its sublime mysteries, its pagan, its occult, and its Manichaean philosophies. And this ends the reading for today on the 13th of May. Thank you, Brett, that you came back to the table today and we could do this recording. Oh, you're most I certainly feel, welcome. And thank I you feel, for reading, Jörg. <laughs> I, feel just, I feel just wonderful right now. I Good. feel so full of the Holy Spirit. This was really a wonderful, wonderful reading. After all this dark stuff we have gone through in the pages oh, before this book yes. with the Freemasonry and secret societies and all that stuff, I got a little bit sick of this book. Now I can <laughs> to love it. I can't help but agree with you, Jörg. It was really hard. Yeah, the, the past 50 pages maybe? I don't know. More than that maybe. Yeah, yeah, it was kind Starting of a with dark the Rhodes subject. gang and all that, the round tables and man, yeah, Cecil Rhodes. That's pretty big stuff, actually. It doesn't especially appear when that it came way, into but... the Bushes and, and Clinton administration. Oh, Skull and, and Bones. Stuff. Yeah, right. Yeah. So that's a hundred pages ago, believe it or not. So yeah. That's a lot of lot of dark stuff. <laughs> yeah, a lot of Very dark stuff. Very dark. Yeah. It's the obfuscation of this crooked world. And they don't want anyone talking about it openly, so they make it so dirty that you can't, really. So. Okay, so let's wrap it up for today. Yeah, uh, great, Yerk. Wonderful. We'll, we'll have an appointment later when we will do another reading of Cold World Babylon. 666, Danger in the Vatican, the Sons of Loyola and their plans for world domination. And never forget, the Jesuits are a very, very, very dangerous and satanic secret society. But the biggest enemy of them all is Satan. And he is the master as well as of the Jesuits as he is of the Roman Catholic Church. And the Roman Catholic Church and their hidden agenda is much older than just the Jesuits, who are just a tool. And when you have Jesus Christ, you don't have to fear neither the one nor the other, whether the former nor the latter. With Jesus Christ in your heart, you don't have to fear anything but the wrath of God if you don't listen and adhere to his voice and his 
commandments. And by that, thank you for watching, listening, commenting, and probably also returning next time when we will continue in this chapter 44 of Code Word Babylon. Maranatha. Thanks, Yerk. And to all our listeners, don't forget to put on the whole armor of God. Get your Bible out, study it, and do some good research and prayer and arm yourself for the, the coming battle to come. And we'll catch you next time. Bye-bye. For the first time in human history, for the first time in all of human history, almost all of mankind is politically awake. And these new and old major powers face still yet another novel reality, in some respects unprecedented. And it is that while the lethality, the lethality of their power is greater than ever, their capacity to impose control over the politically awakened masses of the world is at a historical low. I once put it rather pungently, and I was flattered that the British Foreign Secretary repeated this as follows. Namely, in earlier times, it was easier to control a million people, literally, it was easier to control a million people than physically to kill a million people. Today, it is infinitely easier to kill a million people than to control a million people. It is easier to kill than to control. We're, we're, we're at the very beginning stages of a very brutal and bloody conflict. Um, and I believe that um, we've come horribly off track uh, in the years uh, since the fall of the Soviet Union. And we're starting uh, now in the 21st century which I believe strongly is a crisis both of our church, a crisis of our faith, a crisis of the West, and a crisis of capitalism. His son Jesus is here in our midst. His bride, the church, is honored to host an event affirming the dignity of the human person and the sacredness of all human life. I think Russia is no longer a communist state, first of all. That's very important to realize. It hasn't yet defined itself, however, effectively as a democracy. It is still uncertain. We're, we're at the very beginning stages of a very brutal and bloody conflict, of which if the people in this room and the people in the church do not bind together and really form what I feel is an aspect of the church militant, if the people in this room and the people in the church do not bind together and really form what I feel is an aspect of the church militant, the church militant, to really be able to not just stand with our beliefs, but to fight for our beliefs against this new barbarity that's starting, uh, that we will literally eradicate everything that we've been bequeathed over the last uh, 2,000 to 2,500 years. You didn't mention the president by name, but it was hard not to conclude that that's who you were referring to. Is that fair? I was certainly referring to the threats that we are now facing with this stated goals of this administration, which would upset the last 70 years of a new world order, which was established after World War II. 70 years based on human rights, respect for the law, uh, free trade, all of the things and aspects of this world order that took place after one of the most horrific, uh, terrible wars in history, and I'm for maintaining it. We are grateful to be citizens of one nation under God, who acclaim this evening that in God we trust. Bless our two candidates, our benefactors, and those whom the L. Smith Foundation has been honored to serve for seven decades. Guide us safely home, both this evening and for all eternity, through Christ our Lord. Amen.